Blockchain offers a variety of, of, of big advantages, but it's not al always obvious for people to, to, know, to know them. Uh, at the moment, we have a kind of situation where everyone just knows they need blockchain, but uh, only half of the people um, uh, know why they actually can use it or uh, why it can be of, uh, of benefit. Um, just to, to make it clear, I mean, the blockchain is a data storage um, in chronologically ordered blocks. Um, it, uh, where, where it's important to say that those blocks cannot be altered or manipulated and um, the uh, changes of the state uh, uh, is, is happening by a, a cryptographically uh, authentication. Um, what that uh, brings, or how can I say, e simply put, um, blockchain uh, has the uh, has a, a great benefit of blockchain is to create trust in an environment where no one needs to trust any other one, um, and this is in, uh, very uh, spectacular because um, you ha you have a lot of uh, uh, situations where e no company ca can trust a competitor competing company, but they can they have a consensus on the blockchain ledger where they can everyone trust on the system without having any central entity that regulates that or, um, or controls that. Mostly in most markets you just have central authorities or central entities where everyone needs to trust them and they are building the trust. But in blockchain this is not needed anymore. And this is a big thing. This is a big thing in various markets, finance markets, for example, also in healthcare um, or other uh, uh, markets, uh, it, just on a kind of meta level in between companies. Um, so I, I'm, I'm telling this uh, specifically because uh, you hear also sometimes smaller companies that want to migrate to the blockchain where sometimes certainly it, there is some application, but mostly the big applications for blockchain is on a higher level. So it's in between companies. It's not for one company migrating to the blockchain. It's mostly of big benefit on where, for example, a whole market uh, is finding a public ledger to, to use. The, the banks, for example, using their own blockchain or the, um, the uh, healthcare system eventually or any kind of um, uh, the notaries uh, use a, a public ledger together these, in these situations. There is a big uh, difference between uh, private and, uh, and public blockchains. And um, you see here, uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, table summarizes uh, the, the most important points. Um, what I specifically want to say here is that the more private a blockchain gets, the more it's getting similar to a, to a database. Um, if if uh, you have uh, two entities or one entity having a blockchain, um, then uh, the, the use case gets more and more questionable because the really strength of the blockchains are unfolding if you have a larger um, uh, group or a larger set of entities. And um, this is... Uh, I'm saying this because uh, a lot of... Uh, great benefits that you, you have with blockchain come really to, uh, to, to highlight on, on the public blockchain side. And uh, I, I don't want to say private blockchains are uh, not of that, of that great use, not at all. Private blockchains have great functionalities, um, but certainly if you make it too private, then some of the big uh, benefits are, are just disappearing. I'm, I'm talking about benefits like having a decentralized system. Um, where you don't have a, 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 you don't need trusted entities. So that's, for example, the more public it is, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, the, the more decentralized it can get. Um, other things, for example, uh, where the difference is the, uh, the incentive uh, for maintaining, maintaining, maintaining it. Uh, for the public blockchains, you have the economic reward of the miners, for example, or stakers, or or um, depends on the consensus uh, mechanism, and uh, you have on the, on the private side, you have the reputation. Um, where is it stored is also a, a big thing. When you, when you look at vulnerability or things, you're way better having a decentralized distribution than a central servers. Um, so it really um, depends on the, on the use case, which, uh, which blockchain is of, of better use. Um, 
just to look at also on the other side, for example, if you have a, um, a market of only a few entities um, where they can generally trust each other to a certain degree, it's probably preferable to have a private blockchain because they don't benefit so much of, of, of the, um, of the uh, uh, ha making it public because uh, they can just have better control when it's private. And um, yeah, this is for example, that the, the, bank, the banks are thinking about uh, <laughs> having, a, having their own private chain or maybe using Ethereum or, 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 or uh, one of the current uh, public blockchains. And this is the, 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 kind of, um, the kind of dialogue that is currently uh, happening there. What is the best? Uh, for example, IBM is mainly looking into providing private blockchain solutions for entities. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the major uh, difference. When you are looking, for example, now, I think a very good example of, a, of, the pub, of, pu of public blockchains are the cryptocurrencies. This is really a, a, fen a very remarkable phenomenon and a very in, uh, exciting market, what is happening there. And um, you can see on this... Uh, uh, diagram that the ecosystem really works uh, very well in the, with these three entities. You have the users as the, uh, and the merchants that vitalize the network. They use the exchange and the payment providers that bond the network. And uh, you have the miners that uh, secure the network. And all this interacting with each other. And it's a really, uh, it's, it's a, yeah, I mean, you can see it. Uh, there is a lot of cryptocurrencies out there at the moment. And, um, uh, there's some really interesting uh, uh, dynamics uh, emerging and uh, very uh, interesting markets uh, uh, happening. Um, there, here's just a, a summary of uh, the most important features of cryptocurrencies. Um, I think most of you are familiar uh, probably with cryptocurrencies. So I, I don't need to uh, explain the, the basics, but yeah, here... Um, is uh, the, the, the most, the, the, the biggest highlights uh, of, of cryptocurrencies. I mean, in shortly put, I think you can phrase it like that. With cryptocurrencies, you can, um, you, uh, you can send money from anywhere in the world to anywhere, in, uh, anywhere else in the world without any boundaries, completely free, uh, within light speed, uh, you can send uh, money. This is a big thing. This is an application that a lot of the cryptocurrencies uh, offer, and that is happening because it is, a, uh, it is based on public blockchain. So there is no, um, there is no central authority. There is no, uh, it's completely decentralized, and uh, yeah, there is no, yeah, there is no regulator or anyone that can block transactions or or there are no boundaries. It's a global scale. There is no country borders or or anything like that. And just to give one example of, I mean, um, uh, Bitcoin uh, and one use case, uh, at the moment if you try to send money uh, from here to, to a farmer in Africa, you will probably relatively quickly realize that there are some difficulties. Um, and uh, until the money is there, it takes a long time, if it will happen at all. And uh, it also will cost quite a lot because there are a lot of intermediary banks uh, or intermediaries in general that take a, a cut. So uh, cryptocurrencies makes it indeed possible to send um, money from here within Lightspeed to a farmer in, uh, in Africa uh, and having no costs um, in between and no boundaries. Um, yeah, coming back to the public blockchains um, where really there's the, the big innovation happening uh, big uh, the decentralization and, uh, and all the great benefits uh, blockchain offers. Um, we have the two uh, giants at the moment, and um, most of you are probably uh, very familiar with them. Um, we have Bitcoin on the one hand, of course, the, the, the oldest um, blockchain with, uh, with which all started. Uh, if Satoshi Nakamoto wouldn't have invented Bitcoin, we wouldn't uh, all uh, sit here and uh, talk about blockchain or uh, Bitcoin, of course. And we have Ethereum, um, which offers uh, a variety of great benefits uh, in a different way uh, than Bitcoin. Um, 
And uh, I have to say, I mean, uh, I think uh, some of you may, might have, um, um, how can I say, uh, uh, yes, uh, were involved maybe in the uh, scaling debate of Bitcoin. There was this kind of debate how to scale the network. The blocks went more and more full, which is an ongoing debate. But I have to say, uh, looking at the moment at the, um, uh, the, the solutions that are provided to this and how Bitcoin can grow, we have uh, on-chain scaling like Segwit or uh, Snore uh, signatures. Uh, we have second level uh, 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 layer uh, scaling like the Lightning or Thunder network and we have sidechains, rootstock, smart contracts. There is really a lot of innovation going on in Bitcoin and this is really great to see. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, Bitcoin, uh, probably as uh, optimistic, uh, optimistic as rarely before. And um, with Ethereum you have some other great benefits. You have the smart contracts which make it possible for a lot of developers to uh, directly um, code apps based on, 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 on the Ethereum blockchain, which is really great. This is something that you don't have so easily with Bitcoin. For example, I was in Shanghai on the, on the DEF CON uh, recently and there were more than 700 uh, developers, um, very passionate, came from all over the world, flew to Shanghai and wanted to bring up their ideas and wanted to start coding uh, applications based on, on the blockchain. And this is very simple. Uh, uh, made with Ethereum, with the smart contracts. Um, so, for example, the smart contracts just uh, provide this kind of ease for a, for a developer to code whatever they want in their smart contract and not having to influence the, the Ethereum chain uh, directly. Um, and this is really, really cool. That, that can drive the innovation a lot. In Bitcoin, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, changes in the Bitcoin blockchain are very... Yeah, sometimes very difficult, of course, and you see already on the, chailing, uh, on the scaling debate that uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, it takes quite a while. This has, of course, some, some disadvantages in that regard, but it also has some advantages because the, every step is well, well thought and there's just, I mean, Bitcoin is the, the biggest and most secure chain at the moment, so there's a lot of stake at, uh, uh, in, involved. It's more than $11 billion market uh, capacity right now, so people need to be very aware of what changes are made to the Bitcoin blockchain. But the difference is that Bitcoin doesn't o uh, offer this kind of container for developers to develop their own apps uh, as easy as uh, in the smart contracts for Ethereum at the moment, uh, for example. Um, what both chains uh, have in common, and that's why I, uh, th that's how I can um, uh, how we come to mining, is they both rely on a trustful uh, consensus system. And for both currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, those this consensus system is the proof of work. And uh, proof of work, I mean, um, how can I say? Uh, this is something. Uh, I mean, someone. Somewhere has this trust uh, in the system uh, has to come from. And if you don't have a central entity who establishes this trust, where, whatever, where everyone needs to trust in, um, you, uh, how can I say, you, you, need a, you need this consensus system for that. And this is established by the miners in the proof of work consensus system for Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and Bitcoin. Um, and uh, yeah, so in that regard, the miners are validating the transactions for both uh, blockchains and are, of course, essential in that, in that way and are also securing the network. That's another very important point uh, to understand because uh, for, proof of, for consensus systems in general, if you have more than 50%, you are, the con you, you are de determining the, con uh, the consensus. So if you are more than half of the entities, you can... You can do whatever you want with the chain, you can attack the chain, you can destroy it. So that this is not happening on those chains, it's important that there is a lot of hash, hash power and a lot of mining capacity already in the chain so that an, a, a new entity cannot easily get more than 50% and hijack the chain. So they are securing in that regard, the miners are essential for securing the blockchains are, and are essential for uh, yeah, uh, validating the transactions. So really, this is, this is a very critical point. So uh, um, 
Yeah, public blockchains need a consensus system. The best consensus system we have at the moment is the proof of work, and proof of work is the miners uh, calculating their hash functions and validating the transactions and thereby securing the blockchain. I think if you understand that, that's, this is a very critical point uh, to understand in what way mining and blockchain has to uh, indirect or um, has to do with each other. Um, when we're talking about mining, um, there has a lot of things have happened in this, in this space. Um, uh, when we look at, for example, Bitcoin in the first days of Bitcoin, Satoshi mined with his own laptop, mined all the coins that were generated because he was the only miner. This is really uh, incredible. So he mined more than one million Bitcoin with his, with his laptop with his, uh, or with his first computers. And um, of course, as the market grew, there were more incentive for technical-oriented uh, people to optimize the mining and uh, get a, a larger market share. And um, yeah, uh, therefore mine uh, um, uh, Bitcoins or uh, Ether or other uh, cryptocurrencies. So it, we had the first stage was the CPU. The second stage was the GPUs. The, uh, people started using their graphic cards, which were more powerful uh, than the CPUs, but needed uh, a little bit more optimization. Then the first kind of real techies came, uh, uh, got, got involved and developed the first FPGA modules, which are uh, stronger than the GPUs. And then, I mean, which we are now obviously in Bitcoin, uh, the ASIC machines, uh, the ASIC miners came, where really, where, where you really have um, you have a chip uh, in silicon, uh, which is doing nothing else than running those optimized hash uh, functions that you need for mining. So those chips are very stupid in a way because they only, for example, in Bitcoin they only can run these double SHA hash functions, and uh, and do the mining. Um, but they are very powerful in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in doing this specific operation. And of course the ASIC, uh, there, we have certain nanometer sizes and of course the technology is arising and going forward more and more. The newest ASICs at the moment are at 16 nanometer, 16, 14 nanometer, which is, uh, which is very remarkable. And um, yeah, I think Intel is now uh, uh, going to 10 nanometer uh, in their next um, in their next uh, in their next chips. So this is a very uh, exciting uh, field. And um, just this was now the example for Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, for Ethereum, there is no ASICs uh, uh, at the moment, um, and that is also because Ethereum is uh, uh, at some point uh, switching over to a uh, proof of stake uh, consensus system. I don't want to go too much into the details here, but for Ethereum, we are still at the GPU level. Some people, some rumors are going that there are some uh, FPGA modules, but uh, this, the most hashing power in Ethereum certainly is the GPU. <coughs> so um, now about the structure of the mining world. Um, I think we can cate categorize that into two main categories. And that is the home miners, which, I mean, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, uh, or other cryptocurrencies are decentralized. And that's really the sense of it. So um, you, have, you can plug your own machine, your, you can plug your own computer in and, and start mining. Uh, or you can just purchase a machine and plug it in your home. Um, and, then, uh, yeah, and then you are basically a home miner. So this is the one category of miners, those are the home miners ordering machines um, uh, and uh, plugging them into their uh, plugs at home. And uh, yeah, they're, uh, yeah, you're using, the home miners are mostly uh, installing their hardware uh, using standard PC accessories. Uh, and installation of software using mostly com community-driven open source programs. That is the one category, and this is the other one, which has emerged over the time and of course have grown more and more. By now it's really a massive industry, um, and I can say, I mean, in Bitcoin, also in Ethereum, um, <laughs> There is uh, only a few very large, massive uh, mining facilities around the world saturated and points where there is the lowest electricity and most beneficial infrastructure. And um, yeah, uh, being at those places and growing further and further. And um, yeah, this is the large scale mining. And uh, for large scale mining, the um, miners, uh, 
are using their own proprietary uh, optimized software. They are using the economy of scale in order to get, uh, of course, uh, economic uh, advantages. And they have really the, um, they're aiming that there's literally a kind of war between the big mining uh, organizations to find the lowest uh, electricity rates on the planet. And that's very interesting as well, where it really is the lowest electricity. Sometimes uh, there are some, uh, some um, areas arising that you would have never thought that there is so, so cheap electricity. Sometimes there are some other um, su uh, government subsidies or um, other uh, interesting uh, phenomena happening um, that really make some spots interesting, which you probably never have thought about. What you see here in the picture is that uh, the first is the, uh, the Enigma Farm. The Enigma Farm is um, our largest, or it is uh, the largest Ethereum mining facility on the, on the world. Um, uh, if you look, for example, in processing units, you're talking in, uh, in, in flops. Maybe you, you have known that. I mean, in the mining world, you're talking about hashes per second. But if you want to make it general, you're, uh, if you com compare, for example, supercomputers on the world, you're mostly talking about uh, flops. And um, the uh, uh, Enigma farm has uh, 34.8, um, I think, uh, co comparable petaflops, which is higher than the, uh, just on a side note, is more than the uh, world's uh, number one supercomputer, Tianhe 2, uh, in China. Of course, I mean, this, this differentiation is a bit uh, vague in some points because we are not aiming for flops, we are aiming for hashes, the com uh, supercomputer are uh, doing other kinds of um, uh, processing. But it's still, I think, a remarkable fact there is multiple megawatts involved and those farms are just yeah, very large and, um, and have some really big sizes. Uh, on the uh, picture below, you're seeing, the, uh, you're seeing an ASIC uh, facility, uh, it's Bitcoin ASIC miners. And um, yeah, that just should just give an impression of how big these facilities are by now. Um, now, I think uh, it's time to really just, uh, I don't want to make it too, de too detailed, but I uh, want uh, to, to tell you briefly about why mining or investing in the mining economy is an uh, interesting opportunity. And I think this uh, little graph here shows, the, shows actually the, the main argument or um, explains it uh, very well. Um, if you're looking here uh, on, the, on the graph directly, you have three kinds of simplified miners. You, we're assuming now a scenario of having three different miners, uh, three different efficiency classes of miners uh, in the market. And um, the blue line is the highest efficient miner. The, the uh, orange line is the medium, and the, the green line is the lowest efficient miner. And um, now we are assuming um, each miner has the same capacity, but of course the less efficient miner has a higher cost, a higher ongoing cost of maintaining the operation. And now we are uh, on the, going to the right, you see the time. We're assuming now that the profitability is dropping over time for the whole market. And then we're looking at the, re uh, at the income of each uh, miner uh, over the time. And what you're seeing here is that uh, as time goes by and profitability decreases, you see, for example, that the green uh, miner, the lowest efficient miner, at one point is just standing still and there's no more return coming because uh, they, have to, they have to drop out, they have to, um, uh, they have to shut down their operation because at one point when the profitability decreases and they have the ho highest ongoing costs, their, their costs are higher than what they earn and they consequently have to drop out. So they, they turn down their, their farm and cons consequently for the medium and the highest efficient miner, for the orange and the blue line, they get a boost in revenue because of course the pie stays the same um, but the green one steps out so the others have, have a boost in, in profit and revenue. So as time goes by then, um, the orange and blue one earn uh, a decent amount, uh, of, uh, get a, a good profit, but then at some point as the profitability dec decreases further, the orange one has to drop out. Because, um, yeah, because the, the, it's just not profitable anymore, so that means uh, the orange one stays still and the blue one gets another boost. 
So the blue one, if, so the, the, the core message out of this is if you are the most efficient miner, mining can be a very interesting and very uh, profitable uh, investment. But you know, you, you need to know how to do it right. And this is sometimes very challenging and not always uh, clear um, because you never know what your competitors uh, are up to and how strong and efficient your competitors are. Um, just r when it comes to efficiency, simply put, there is three kind of efficiencies uh, or uh, three kinds of things uh, uh, that uh, you need to be aware of. You have the hardware efficiency, of course, the chips. You need to the, the, the chips at some point they need to be the strongest, of course. We have the infrastructure efficiency, um, which is the the cooling and uh, economy of scale, and we have the electricity rates, which uh, determine also the um, uh, the, the, the costs, so they have to be minimum as well. Um, here is another thing, I don't want to go into too much of the details, but if you are looking, the cryptocurrency space is very big and there's a lot of cryptocurrencies, um, you can think now one step further and think, oh well, uh, for example the GPUs, they, ca they are uh, very dynamic in the algorithm, so they can, um, if one coin for example is too difficult to mine, they can just go on another coin, mine that, if it's easier, and the return is higher, they, um, they can just switch over and mine the other coin. So if you go one step further, you can think of, oh, wow, actually I could um, look at the whole cryptocurrency market, look at what coins to mine, and then determine a portfolio and do portfolio optimization of coins to mine and, uh, and uh, spread the hash rate amongst uh, a certain set of coins um, and then uh, yeah, mine those coins and then auto-convert it, for example, to the gold currency, to Bitcoin. And this can, of course, be more efficient and more profitable than only mining Bitcoin or only mining a certain uh, currency and having to, to deal with the difficulty, uh, um, uh, the rising difficulty. One thing uh, as a closing uh, remark I want to mention that um, Genesis Mining has, uh, uh, we have um, created the first uh, regulated a Bitcoin mining fund uh, a few months ago, and uh, it's the Logos fund. It's um, uh, Bafin uh, approved, which is the German uh, uh, authority, financial uh, authority, and um, it's also we also have an uh, American entity which is SEC approved. Um, this is the only um, way at the moment uh, for people investing uh, in mining in a, on a securities uh, level, and we have done that because there is just a lot of interest. Uh, for uh, institutional investors and um, and uh, uh, and uh, funds and uh, just um, uh, in, um, uh, investment various kinds of uh, investment entities and uh, they would prefer to have a, a regulated structure in order to invest in uh, in mining so um, if you're interested in uh, investing in mining in a securities uh, on a security level logos fund is the way to go you can find more information on logos-fund.com and um, it offers a variety of, uh, of advantages compared to uh, in, uh, investing in, uh, in mining directly. One is, for example, that you can liquidate your shares uh, at a later stage, which is, is sometimes not always given if you're uh, investing in a farm directly. Um, yeah, to the, the last word now, um, if you want to go into mining, I think right now uh, is the best time. Why? Because um, there's only 25% uh, of all Bitcoins left to be mined and there's only 15% of all the Ether around uh, left to be mined. I think it's even way less, probably around 10%, which is um, very remarkable. And I can tell you right now, I mean, uh, a lot of big institutions and, uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, companies are uh, looking, or uh, venture capitalists, uh, various kinds of uh, investment entities are looking into how do they get the most amount of Bitcoin, the most amount of Ethereum, uh, or how, how do they best leverage in the market. And it's not always as trivial as just going on the exchange and buying them, especially if it's about, uh, about a lot of money, because uh, the market is not arbitrarily uh, liquid, and um, there are often better ways. And one way is, for example, to really start large-scale mining operations and uh, mine the coins. Um, and this is, this is a very uh, interesting uh, opportunity and if you want to do that right now, this is the best time and 
Yeah, uh, one thing I think I don't need to uh, say uh, to, to clear, probably all of you know, uh, who are familiar with uh, economics, uh, there is an increasing demand by the growing adoption of cryptocurrencies. I mean, Bitcoin is getting more and more popular, Ethereum is getting more and more popular, but uh, simultaneously the increasing scarcity um, uh, is happening. Uh, uh, for example, Bitcoin uh, block halving. At the moment, there is only 1,800 Bitcoins every day that are mined. And uh, in four years, there's only 900 Bitcoins per day that are mined. And in another four years or another period uh, to the next halving, there's only 450 Bitcoins that are mined every day. So there's the halving period um, that makes uh, Bitcoin more and more scarce. Uh, and uh, that uh, means growing scarcity, but also growing demand. And um, some might uh, come to the conclusion then that this might uh, probably result in, a, in an increasing uh, price of the uh, of the underlying. Um, I thank thank I thank you all for for the attention, and I hope we, I could uh, clarify some uh, of uh, your understanding in mining and the opportunities.